James Moines. I'm going to talk about the Berlin Wall, complexities, and unintended consequences. Stay tuned. Now, I visited Berlin in 2016, and for me, I thought I was just going to look at a future-oriented uh, Berlin and, and Eastern, former Eastern Germany, and ultimately, I walked away quite differently. And uh, also, my, my background was a undergraduate in political science, and I had a great interest in group politics and Eastern European politics, simply because during that period of time, it was the end of the Cold War. So it was quite fascinating and exciting to look at this particular era, as well as the DDR, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, and other member states of the Warsaw Pact. Now, I thought I'd look at this in terms of just being an anachronistic period of time. Instead, uh, of course, I thought maybe my mindset was that was then, this is now. And we really wouldn't delve any further into what was the Berlin Wall. And ultimately, I walked away quite differently when I started to think about what I learned in college uh, I did learn a lot, but ultimately you have to delve a little bit further to understand probably the nuances and why this was a cold center or the Cold War center. And uh, this building is pretty emblematic in many ways. It doesn't exist any longer. It was known as the Palast de Republic. Now, the Palast was a uh, building that encompassed a lot of things. It was a unicameral body of the Volkskammer, as well as uh, 13 restaurants, a bowling alley, discotheque, theater, performing arts center, art gallery, and a post office. Now, this is under one roof. It would be like the Capitol building in the United States containing all these things. And oh, by the way, anybody can go in any given time. And uh, so it was a really interesting very postmodern architecture. This was constructed in 1973, finished in 1976. Complexities of this building is really what makes it kind of that emblem of uh, the DDR, um, as well as the Berlin Wall. So this was the site of the Berliner Stadtschloss, which was demolished in 1950. It was heavily damaged during World War II. Now, the Stadtschloss is not just any building. It was constructed in 1443 and was really the center of the um, German Empire. Uh, the Prussian Empire. And, uh, you know, it was something that you look at today. There was not a lot of protest back then because this was the former East Germany, the former communist controlled portion of Germany. Now, demolishing this building was really uh, not much of a something to think about or overthink because that was really an imperial building and it didn't, uh, you know, align with the, the views of the communist government uh, at that point. So it was knocked down. Now, this building or this site was left empty for 23 years before the palace was constructed. Now, the architects are Haas Grafunder and Karl and Schwora. Now, this is really, you know, I find this architecture very interesting and very encompassing. You can see people here on the, on the ground level. It's about five stories high. It's a pretty voluminous building. And uh, so this was really the symbol of the socialist government of uh, East Germany, looking very forward looking. This represents the Alexanderplatz area. Now, this area is, uh, you know, heavily constructed with the uh, Versenturm as well as the Plattenbau architecture. Now, the architecture, in my opinion, is stunning. It's so mid-century, right on and, and amazing to look at and something I very much enjoy. So on Karl Marx Ali as well as Karl Liebekanikstrasse, you're going to find a lot of, you know, very Plattenbau structures and some very, very eye-catchy structures like the Haus der Lehrers as well as a hawk house on the Wiebeweise. And so these are, you know, emblematic structures of this period of time. So I, I would say architecture is quite alive. And seeing this is, is quite a stunning uh, piece of architecture. I love mid-century modern. And I look upon this very differently uh, in terms of this being a very uh, forward-looking, future-looking structure that you wouldn't have seen in other parts of the Warsaw Pact states. And so for that, I give that, uh, you know, quite, uh, you know, thumbs up because I think the architecture is something that, again, you don't see in terms of uh, state capital or international capital buildings or nation state capital buildings. So it's very, very well done. Now, Helmut Kohl was the chancellor at the, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. He was not a fan of anything of the former East Germany. Instead of being a reunification 
It was more of a takeover of East Germany, and East Germans or former East Germans knew that. And uh, most uh, Berliners in, in polls showed that they didn't want this particular building destroyed. And, uh, you know, the reason, the official reason was there was asbestos contamination. But I would point out that there were a lot of other architectures built in this period of time. And uh, might they not have the same uh, architectural material? The answer is probably yes. But uh, this was at the uh, bullseye of the chancellor. And whatever the chancellor wants, the chancellor gets. Now, this is something that is further complex in terms of while this was raised what remains is the basement so the basement still exists and on top of that is a brand new Stadtschloss and that is uh, going to be opened up in the next few years a couple years or so and that I find to be absolutely emblematic so I wish just like Berliners this would not have been raised and would have been maybe re-implemented uh, as a different structure Hans Grafunder uh, said this could be a art museum or performing arts center and he offered to uh, retrofit this or redesign this to fit that use. Now, I'm going to talk about the checkpoints. We often think on our collective imagination of just maybe a singular checkpoint. That is Checkpoint Charlie, which is right here on my screen. And uh, we don't look at the other checkpoints. The checkpoints are really uh, controlling measures for you know people entering or exiting West Berlin into East German territory. And that is something very, very fascinating because not all these um, checkpoints were created equal. So Checkpoint Charlie was an international checkpoint. Uh, diplomats could go through there. Uh, people of non-German or non-West um, Berlin citizenship could go through there. In fact, that's the, one of the few areas they could go through. They could also go through Checkpoint Bravo, but that was only to get westbound to West Germany only. Now, you could also go through right here the Waltersdorfer Chauze if you were an American citizen, but only if and only if you had a flight out of Schunenfeld Airport, which is about right here in the same area. So Schunenfeld Airport still exists today. You can look at each of these particular uh, checkpoints and see the unique uh, uniqueness of them and how in many ways I look at this and say, well, none of them exist today. And secondly, uh, except maybe Checkpoint Bravo, there's some of the material left over and some of the buildings still exist. But if you look in this entire area, nothing looks like this today. And for most visitors to Berlin, they're thinking, oh, I, I'm going to see something of the, of the past. And uh, it pretty much doesn't exist. Now, looking at checkpoints, you know, I'm going to go through and, and give you a showing of some of the checkpoints. Like Now, this is Chauze Straza. When you look at this, it looks like a movie set. It doesn't look quite real, but I'm very fascinated by it uh, because this is near the northern portion or northwest portion of the uh, east-west Berlin Wall. Now, here is uh, three other checkpoints you have right here in the upper uh, portion is the Bornholmer checkpoint. And I like it's very emblematic with the... Um, uh, East German um, emblem, as well as Checkpoint Bravo on the lower left. On the lower right is Checkpoint Charlie. So this is Checkpoint Charlie, and this doesn't look quite real. It's just pretty antiquated photos. This could have been in the 70s, early 70s. It did change over time, and there was constant retrofitting of the walls themselves. Now looking at this, this is Glynica Bridge. Now you can see here, this is famous for a lot of uh, transfers of prisoners and they would basically be spies from either East Germany being uh, turned over back to West Germany or the West and uh, vice versa. This is uh, Stecken Spandau. Now this is really just a train route from East uh, Berlin to West Berlin or uh, West Germany to West Berlin. Here is Hirschstrasse. This is in the Western section of West Berlin. This is a very diminutive checkpoint. Uh, surprising it looks like this. I mean, I would have expected all checkpoints to be a little more, um, I wouldn't say foreboding, but a little more significant in size and structure. Now, this is in the southwestern or southeastern section of uh, West Berlin. This is Heinrich Heine Strasse. And, of course, nothing looks like this today. This is the Oberbaumbrücke. Uh, this is the only picture I could find of it. This was in the American sector. I wish there were, there were some photographs that existed um, beyond this particular photograph. This is pretty early on. Just looking at this particular portion of the wall, this looks like it was 1961. 
Now, this is Waltdorfer Chausi. Now, this again, as I mentioned, is your entry point if you had a ticket to fly out of Schoenenfeld Airport. Now, there's a complex history in a complex century. So there was unforeseen circumstances which created a perfect storm of historical events, which really uh, created unintended consequences. So from monarchy to republic to fascist regime to division of both communist and capitalist states, then a reunion of the states. And that's all within 100 years. I can't think of another city or major city in Europe that's experienced this or anywhere else in the world, actually. So not so long ago. We think the Berlin Wall was so long ago in our, our collective memory, but instead it was just uh, you know a quarter century ago. The wall was a superbly complex set of barriers retrofitted four times. So it's not this monolith that people have in their collective imagination. It was a set of systems. We have so little photographic evidence or other documentation of the wall. It really was only photographed from the west to the east because it wasn't legal to photograph from the east. I do have one photo from the east in this deck I'll show you in a moment. And uh, so it's unfortunate we have so few details, even though this was not that long ago. So it's a famous structure, and I would say that very, very few people saw this up in its entirety. And uh, yes, there were about 12,000 soldiers, East German soldiers, that were present on the site. But ultimately, they didn't see each portion of the site. In fact, there's probably just a handful of people who ever really saw the entire wall in its entirety. Now, it may just seem like a historical aberration. But history is not always about a progression. Instead, it's something about, uh, you know, history is a, a movement of both up and down. And uh, it's also to understand the why. Why did things happen the way they did? I was intrigued when I saw a documentary by Deutsche Welle. It was called Walden. And I was really even more fascinated by the supporting document or supporting video called Making of Walden. It did tell how difficult it was to make this video simply because the animators didn't have a complete record, a, a visual record of the site they were trying to um, um, animate. And that was really the Bernauer Straße. So the Brandenburg Gate, Bernauer Straße, and uh, these were probably the most photographed of the particular portions of the Berlin Wall. And there was so little documentation left. I suspect there's probably a lot of photographic documentation, but those are stored in uh, maybe particular militaries of um, the allies or former allied partners, uh, zone owners of the Berlin Wall and the city of Berlin itself. Now, they had to really make a lot of guesses in terms of what this particular, uh, you know, making of Walden or making of the Berlin Wall, what it looked like, because, again, there was a lot of source material available to them. So here's a Berlin timeline, 20th century. A lot has happened. So you have actually I left out right here the monarchy that exists prior to World War II, and hence uh, the monarchy ends because of the Kaiser's involvement. Weimar Republic, you know, fast forwarding, you get a division of the four sectors of Berlin as well as Germany itself. And uh, you find uh, a lot of history that happens. The Cold War really begins here. You know, basically the Berlin airlift is pivotal in what becomes, you know, an increased Cold War between East and West. Now, to set the stage, there are three main conferences that really, I would say, create more of a Cold War than there should have been. The Yalta, London, and Potsdam conferences focus in on the immediate close of the war and disposition of a post-war Germany. There really is no plan, specific plan, on how the four zones would operate together or not, let alone there would be two Berlins or two Germanys. And there was no detail on how Berlin would operate. So unintended consequences create the Cold War. Now, you can see the two agreements on the left, which is the London Protocol and the Yalta Conference, are occurring before the end of World War II. Now, you can see the Potsdam Conference after World War II, but if you can see the snapshot here, I'm not going to read each item, but uh, you can see that, uh, for example, France is a fourth partner, according to the Yalta Conference. Denazification. So, again, it's really an overarching macro management of what would happen to a post-war Germany, post-World War II Germany. So, again, much ado about Germany, so little about Berlin. Now, the three agreements talk about, you know, what would happen to the post-war Germany. The documents don't really talk about how the Soviet Union, U.S., U.K., or France would operate the four zones, and in particular, how Berlin would operate. For a time after World War II, including all the four zone operators, it was really, you know, one transport system, one mayor, one unified utility system, free movement to all zones for regardless of uh, citizenship. 
Now, there was an assumption that things would just work, perhaps, or maybe this was by design. I think there was a lot of antagonism by Churchill, and Churchill was really probably the architect, uh, the beginning architect of the Cold War. Now, only air flights were written into the agreement for traveling from, say, West Germany or the West to West Berlin. Ground and rail transportation between West Berlin and West Germany was a courtesy granted by East Germany. Again, it wasn't written into any of the documentation. There are many points of contention, and I would really point out and highlight the block Berlin blockade, which happens for about a year, and even further to exacerbate the Soviet Union and East Germany was a brain drain, so you lose about 20% of the population between 1945 to 1961. What do they do? They get an education completely paid for by the East German government, and they walk over simply to West Germany, and so some of the most talented people in East Germany left for the West. Now, the Soviet Union and East Germany were not happy with the situation. They had planned on a Paris summit, but it was canceled due to a U-2 spy plane incident over the Soviet Union. And that was really intended to clear up some of the difficulties uh, in terms of governing Berlin and uh, getting everything that they wanted in terms of, say, security and uh, understanding and cooperation on how the Berlins would operate. While construction begins of August 13, 1961, and uh, just a few months later, there's a famous Checkpoint Charlie standoff, which shows, you can see this on many videos on YouTube, where there's, you know, tanks are uh, positioned against each other. Of course, nothing happens. And that really begins because of uh, not understanding who could go through the checkpoints without really a lot of um, uh, difficulty. So one American was trying to get through, uh, a diplomat trying to go see an opera or a, a symphony in East Germany. He was stopped. He shouldn't have been stopped based on some of the loose uh, interpretations of, say, diplomats or uh, military officers. So the military, interestingly, could go from each um, point. So East could go to West and West could go to East. The only requirement was that you wear your military garb. You could not have uh, civilian clothing when you went from one section to another, even if you weren't there on official business. That was a requirement. Things started to ease up and some detente happened, a uh, lessening of tension in 1972 with the transit agreement. Now, in 1972 in June, you have the Four Powers Agreement, which is really the four zonal partners, again, at borders of Berlin, and how it would operate uh, transit agreements and uh, even services from uh, East Germany to West Berlin, maybe it'd be water services or fuel services or other things that improved with the Four Powers Agreement. Now, in the 1950s, uh, the demarcation wasn't really known. It wasn't really enforced because it was an open border. Now, uh, the East German government did consult with um, the Soviet Union. The leader at the time was Stalin, and uh, he anointed that it was really the demarcation lines were the border of East to West Germany and East to West Berlin. So Walter Ulbricht was a SED state council chair. He was the head of government or head of state. Ulbricht was the first person to talk about the wall. He mentions the word the, for the very first time. Niemand hat die Absicht eine Mauer zu errichten. So nobody intends on building a wall. That's 15 June 1961. His uh, successor is Erich Honecker. And uh, he is actually the prime organizer, basically like the project manager of the wall itself. So on um, 12th of August, uh, Walter Ulbricht uh, announced to the Volkskammer at Lake Dolan that uh, they were going to build a wall. And that happens on the 13th of August. And uh, Allied partners are not notified this is going to happen. The entire city of uh, West Berlin was surrounded by Soviet and German military. There were basically four wall programs. In 1961, in the upper left corner here was the first wall. Over time, they reinforced the wall, made it more complex and wider. 62 to 65 is very interesting. What they did in 1961 is they built right on the border. In 62 to 65, they built away from the border so they could actually control a few meters away from the wall itself. So basically, they could go on both sides of the wall, patrol the wall if they wanted to, and stop anybody from climbing the wall or even uh, painting on the wall. But a lot of people, of course, did paint on the wall. In 1965 to 75 was the third generation wall you'll see right here. Very interesting picture. Can't tell if it's on the inside or outside. I'm assuming this is the inside wall. Now in 1975 to 1989 was the, the final wall program. 
Now this is a Grunz model Funta von Swansich, and this is, uh, you can see the East Germans patrolling. Very curious picture, a very well-known picture. And uh, they're patrolling on the eastern portion of the wall. And on the other side is a gentleman walking his dog. And uh, basically, he's technically most likely on East German soil still. Here is the Hinterlands Wall. Very, very few pictures exist of the Hinterlands Wall. So this would be facing inside East Germany. This is uh, obviously after the fall of the wall because it's in such disrepair. But again, it's the only one I could find. Now, the wall is a system. It's not a monolith, as I mentioned earlier. It's uh, not particularly forbidding. It's not like a Great Wall of China, for example. So there are many diagrams that at best approximate the wall, but most likely all elements did not exist in one place. It is hard to know what the wall was really like because of such a lack of supporting documentation such as photographs or even video. Photographs are hard to decipher to understand the wall. So the, the images are relatively grainy, not enough resolution to uh, you know make the magnification uh, larger. Angles and shadows complicate the understanding of the wall itself. And uh, so it's a, it's a very fascinating historical lens to think about. And really, I'm asking the question here of, do we really know what the Berlin Wall was really like? I'd say no, we, we really don't know. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. So I did post here, you know, variation of 50 meters to 500 meters was a variation between West Berlin and East Berlin. In reality, this isn't actually true. This is probably even larger than 500 meters at its most uh, significant or largest uh, points. So in West Berlin, just because it was west facing, East Berlin still existed. It just was, uh, the wall is a few meters away from it. You have a tripwire system, anti-vehicle ditches, control strips, roadways, lighting system, hedgehogs or anti-vehicle hedgehogs, a lot of watchtowers. You have bunkers, Stalin's lawn or Stalin's Rosen, dog runs, signal fences, and the hinterlands wall. And again, not all these elements existed in every single spot or portion of the wall. And uh, so I took this, you know, found this picture here. This is the only picture that I can identify. This is actually going to Steinstuken, and you're going to see a dog here, and it looks like a dog kennel. Now, you know, I don't know other places and other photographs that exist. This is the only one I could find that exists of dog kennels, it's highlighting perhaps the dog runt. Now, in the lower left corner is uh, an area near the station, um, the, the subway system called Vetting. And uh, you're going to see, again, you're going to look here, you're not going to see all the elements that you saw in the previous diagram that I drew. Here in the lower right corner is Potsdamer Platz. Now, the reason that diagram, and I actually pretty much copy that diagram, uh, just to show each of the elements that could exist in, the, in its totality, but not in every single place of the wall. And this was probably drawn by, um, I'm guessing, a West or East German uh, military officer. And a lot of people took this to heart in terms of thinking, this is exactly the way the wall is all the way around. Here we show some diagrams where people were drawing this uh, particular more stylized or more modern uh, East-West Berlin uh, barrier system. Here is a little more, um, more information. And again, maybe the anti-vehicle ditch was not always in this position or even there at all. And you had different variations. Maybe the hedgehogs were closer to the western portion of the wall. Now here's another diagram. Um, they tend to be, you know, pretty well done. Uh, I like that many of the walls showing a, a lot of um, 3D capabilities and uh, showing a lot of thoughtful elements. This one shows uh, the fourth generation wall, one, two, and three. Uh, again, I think it's such a nice, nice uh, bit of uh, graphic work here. Now this one I like because it shows the first, second, and third generation walls. They do show a lot of elements that happen over time and what is added to the barrier system of the Berlin Wall itself. Now, I'm pointing out the Berlin Wall Brandenburg Gate because it was such a famous gate. And it was where the only portion, actually where all these people are in the lower right corner, is uh, still technically East Germany. Now, the only people, obviously, that could go on the wall were East German military. And, uh, you know, I love to see these photographs and how amazingly interesting that was. You have famous visitors to the wall. You see John F. Kennedy right here and uh, visiting Berlin where he announces Ich bin ein Berliner. Here on the left side, he's at Checkpoint Charlie. You're going to see here uh, Keith Herring, who is the artist. 
he paints the wall and he paints a good portion of the wall near checkpoint charlie and he's warned by uh you know the west german uh police that he could be arrested he continues to paint he's obviously being photographed here by the east german police um and uh it's something that i i don't know how long this existed and uh i believe it was painted over prior to the fall of the wall robert f kennedy visiting as well as martin luther king here i like this um, particular position because again you can see elements of the wall the hedgehog which is closer to the hinterlands wall this portion here is west berlin here is east uh, berlin you can see all the plattenbau and the versenstern this is uh, what I call the Engeldam or the Bithynian Dam curve. And this particular section was pretty much empty because this was a former canal. Now, this is a rare photo because this is, again, from the Engeldam uh, Bithynian Dam curve and a uh, very iconic curve. But what I find fascinating was this point of view, this East German couple in their wedding day, and they're on the balcony of their apartment. And you can see this hinterlands fence, which I've never seen before. And this is, looks like a see-through fence, basically just a wire gate. And uh, these were probably undoubtedly Communist Party officials because they have a very nice place to live. Although it wouldn't be that nice only because these lights are on at nighttime from the point it gets dark to the point of uh, sunrise. Just showing around the Mitte where the Berlin Wall goes. And you can see like the checkpoint um, the Charité uh, entrance, the Chausey Straße, and Checkpoint Charlie right here. Now, the, because of the uh, unique position and uh, lack of planning, there are strange borders, exclaves, land exchanges, and peculiarities of the wall itself. Now, this is known as Entenschnabel, which is the duck's bill, and uh, this portion here is uh, East Germany. Out here is West Germany or West Berlin. And uh, you're going to see out here was um, usually the L shape of the fence is on the inside. But for whatever reason, this was built on the outside. And here's a, a better uh, picture of the entire section of the Eintenschnabel. Here is the uh, Klein Gleinicke. And this is interesting because right here you have the Gleinicke Bridge, Brucha. And uh, here you see East Germany going into West Germany. Actually, these borders still exist today. Peculiarities, again, Bernauer Straße. Now you have the uh, Church of the uh, Reconciliation. It's standing in the way of the hedgehogs. And uh, in 1985, it was uh, destroyed by the East German government. Now, when I looked at this, this is uh, Erlengrund. And Erlengrund was where I thought, oh, well, this is after you know the end of um, the, the Cold War. This is after the Wall's Fall. But instead, this is where people are going through probably prior to 1989, of course. They go through the wall. There's a doorbell. They ring it through. They go right through to an exclave, which is still uh, West Berlin. And you can see right here, this couple goes through. They check in with um, the East German uh, military officers here. And they go along their way to their garden. And here's a peculiarity. So the fence is about right here in terms of that doorbell from West Berlin going to Erlengrund, and you can actually take this path and going into this area here called the Effective Visa. Land exchanges. Now, this is the Lenné Triangle in 1988. This is uh, on the left side is Potsdamer Platz, and on the right side was the Lenné Triangle. And um, this was a protest. And this is the only time in recorded um, East German history where people from the West defected to the East but that was only temporary because these particular people in this truck, for example, went to Frederikstrasse and went back to West Berlin. And, uh, of course, they were fed by the East German government. And uh, it was very, very interesting to look at this on a map here. It only lasted about a year. So between 1945 to 1988, though the wall was really straight through, this portion here, this triangle, was owned by the East German government, East German territory, East German soil. And you're going to see in 1988 to 89, it became part of West Berlin. From exclave to enclave, Steinstücken. So Steinstücken is very interesting because here was a very small community. About 200 people lived here. And uh, you can see the green uh, lines here, which indicate where a road agreement, based on the four powers and the transit agreements, that were allowed to build a road through here and to get to Steinstücken versus the airlift or sometimes before this road system. Go from uh, Steinstücken 
to East Germany, back to West Berlin. And uh, so the roadway really helped to improve that uh, access as opposed to taking helicopters. So, you know, I'm not going to go through each of these points. I looked at things like dog runs. I'm like 259 dog runs. I have no idea where they are or were. And um, there's really not a lot of documentation open to where they exactly um, existed. Probably in uh, intelligence archives, they do exist. But uh, in terms of the public, we don't know a lot. Uh, we do know there were 302 towers, and today there's so little of the wall left. Only 221 meters or 725 feet exist today. A few more statistics here. Again, I'm not going to go through each of these. So today, this is really the most intact portion of the wall that exists. It's on Bernauer Straße. Now, it's a Berlin Wall Memorial, and while it does a lot to help us understand what the wall system was like. It doesn't have all the elements. Actually, the hedgehogs were removed. They would have been about right here. Or maybe those, the Stalin Rosen uh, is gone. It looks like the signal fence is right here. So the particular portion of this fence is removed. And this is a telecommunication system uh, to go maybe to other towers along the way or other patrol people, patrol milita military patrol. And uh, this is graded, which, you know, ultimately this is not uh, exactly what the wall was like. It's a little antiseptic in my opinion. So unintended consequences still live with us today. And here's an example. So this is from space. This is, uh, I think, taken in 2013. And I'm going to point out this section right here is part of... Uh, was a former East Berlin, and right here was a former East Germany. You can even see these lights here. This was on the outside periphery. That was East Germany. So it probably never will be unified. It's too expensive. Berlin is too poor of a city to make that uh, unified lighting system ever happen. Now, it's hard to imagine, you know, 100 and, you know, 20 years ago, Berlin was a rival to Paris. And this is a particularly interesting picture because it's, it shows such a dirty street and the wall on the right side. And truly, you can look at the East Germans and the East Berliners, and they didn't really care what it looked like on the west side. In fact, this is probably what they really wanted is to have this uh, really unsavory picture and experience for West Berliners. There was really no industry in West Berlin anyway, uh, as the capital had moved to Bonn. Now, the takeaways are, are pretty uh, uh, important to look at. Unintended consequences occur more frequently when there is no plans. It seems obvious, right? But this is a very demonstrative experience of that. Often, they have long-term effects. They don't just really last for that period of time, but they go on beyond that. The thing that needed most attention in agreement got very little attention, which was Berlin. Berlin was symbolic and quartered into four. Did it uh, need four powers control? Not so sure. Since Ber West Berlin was no longer a capital of West Germany, what was the point of keeping it? Well, it was just symbolic. And so those questions weren't really answered. It was really um, something that was a, a, a nagging question for the Soviet Union as well as East Germany. Always important to know details of history. But we must be careful to have the right amount of information when we craft agreements. If we do not, then we're going to miss out on details and there is going to be a lot of unintended consequences. Here is tracing the wall's former path. Now you can see this brick to brick uh, portion goes through parks and streets and everything. And this was built because people would go to Berlin, say, after the fall of the wall. The wall was completely dismantled very, very quickly and rapidly. I really don't think that the civilian uh, takedown of the wall itself was really careful enough to document and photograph because we'd have many of those photographs today or even videos. A lot of people would go to Berlin after the fall of the wall. So people were asking, where did the wall exist? Because we don't see any of it. There's no trace of it. So they decided to build this uh, particular brick system so people could get a better feel for the wall. And I'm going to end here. These are the Grenztruppen, and uh, they are coming from East, East Berlin. And this is probably near the Brandenburg Gate in Potsdamer Platz. So this individual here, he comes through first. And it's really hard to, you know, I, I looked for who these people are. Who are they today? What were their thoughts then? What are their thoughts today? And we really don't have a lot of information. It was just the fall of the wall. And perhaps, uh, you know, when they came through, maybe there was some excitement about it. And maybe there's some trepidation. Maybe there was, you know, there was really not a chance to acclimate to this new uh, unified Germany. And uh, so it's very fascinating to look at unintended consequences. Today, you look at Germany, and it tends to fall on terms of East versus West still. And uh, the East is very conservative, very family-oriented, prefers a lot more, say, daycare, 
because that was really the um, DDR or the East German socialist um, uh, world. And that was to really to have cradle to grave care. And that's something that's really missed today. A simple majority uh, would actually prefer that the wall had never come down, which is very fascinating. I believe that statistic is in the 52 to 54 percent range, which is pretty amazing considering that was a quarter decade ago. So thank you for watching. I appreciate your support. Many more videos to come. And I love your questions and comments down below. Stay tuned for more. Santa.